Hello and thank you for watching this Practically screencast. I will demonstrate a REPL driven development workflow for Clojure using Spacemax. Spacemax is a community configuration for Emacs, which uses the CIDR project for a Clojure development environment. This workflow uses the Clojure CLI tools to configure a project and run the REPL. This workflow will use the aliases from practically ClojureDepths.eden, which is a user level configuration to provide a range of community tools on top of Clojure CLI. And CLJ Condo is a static analysis tool. It shows bugs in our Clojure code as we write them, so we can fix them straight away. Working with Clojure projects. We'll start by creating a new Clojure project. Space single quote opens the eShell pop-up buffer, providing a terminal to run commands. The eShell buffer defaults to the evil insert mode. Use CD to change the directory in which to create the project. A new project can be generated from the app template using this command. Minus X runs a function defined in the project new alias, which is configured to run the CLJ new create function with default values. This command overwrites the default values by providing a specific template name and the name of the project. Once the project has been created, toggle the eShell buffer visibility with space quote or type exit to close this eShell. Now we'll create a layout for the project. Layouts help organize all the buffers for a project and run commands relative to those project buffers. Space LL to select an existing layout or create a layout by typing a new name. Our project is going to be called random function, so we'll create a layout of the same name. Let's open the closure project. Space FF to open the Helm find file and navigate to the file. As we type, then Helm narrows down the files and directories that we can traverse to, making it quicker to navigate. Tab to autocomplete a directory or file name. Control J and Control K will allow us to go and select from the list. If we go down the wrong path, we can use Control H to go back up a level. And when we find the right file, just press return to open it. This is the depths.eden file, the configuration file for the project. Let's just format this to make it a little bit more readable. The path key is showing us the directories that are going to be included in the class path. Depths is showing the libraries we're going to use the project. And we have some additional aliases that are project specific. We can use them when we want to test and also package the project up into an Uber jar for deployment. Before starting a REPL, we should add any libraries as dependencies, although this project only needs closure, so we're ready to start. Comma quote, is the shortcut for running sesman start, which allows us to choose the type of REPL connection we want. Side of jack in, CLJ. We'll start a closure REPL using the Depths Eden project configuration and connect the editor to the REPL once started. There is an indicator in the mode line to show that we are running a closure REPL. You can also use comma M for the connection management menu and hit I to show that we've got a REPL connected. We go back to that menu and do browse, says one browser. It shows us all the side of sessions we've got running. Things are getting a little bit slow. Are you using up all your memory? You can quickly come here and jump to the projects that are running a REPL and shut them down if you want to. Cute quit. So a REPL is running. Okay, let's switch to the source code buffer. So space, find, file. And we narrow down to source, practically random function. And here we have the sample code that's generated by the template we use. Source code buffers are more effective than the REPL buffer as evaluation is always done in the context of the current namespace. To work with CIDR effectively, first evaluate the source code buffer. And we use the evaluation menu, comma E, and B4 buffer. This loads in all the code from this particular file. And now the closure core functions are loaded into the REPL and side of features like help have in the information that they need. If some of the code in your buffer is not compiling, evaluate the namespace instead. So comma E N N. This is also enough to load in closure core into the REPL. When I'm starting with a new project, I create a rich comment block for REPL experiments. And I created a REPL snippet for this which also includes metadata to tell CLJ Condo Lint tool to acknowledge duplicate names. This is very useful when designing your own functions. Using a comment block means that if we go back and evaluate the whole buffer, then the code that we write inside the comment is not evaluated. To start writing closure code, we type the open paren, and like magic, closure mode will automatically add the closing paren for us. This keeps the structure of our code intact. As we type names of functions, suggestions of matching functions appear, along with the documentation, and we can use Control J and Control K, or the up and down arrows, to navigate through the different functions. The project being developed should return a public function chosen at random from a given namespace, showing the documentation for that function. 
Here we can see we have the Closure Core NS Publics, which returns a map of the publicly interned mappings for the namespace. That's going to give us all of the function names from a particular namespace. And we can press tab to auto complete the name. We can also get help by doing comma HH to look at the CIDR doc. And it pops up another buffer with the documentation information, when it was added to Closure, and where it's actually defined. So we could actually go and look at the source code as well. If we needed to see what it did, then we've got all the details there. Let's delete that buffer and go back. We swap back to the documentation buffer. We can see it also shows other functions that are related to this one. Okay, back to the code. And we notice that there is a little squiggle underneath the start of this expression. And a pop-up shows us that NS publics should be called with one argument, but currently we're calling it with zero. So this is CLJ Condo giving us a quick hint that we haven't quite got our code right. And so we can fix that straight away. We do space E and capital L. This shows us all the flytrek errors that we have so far. And in the list, we can just press enter to jump to any of these errors and go and fix them. Uh, we've also got a warning here of this unused binding argument because in main, we're not using the args argument. So uh, we'll need to fix that at some point too. Let's go back and just fix this error now. Star ns star is a dynamic variable which points to the current namespace. So we'll use that as an initial argument. And you can see the squiggly line is now disappeared. So our linter is happy with our code. With CRJ Condo providing live linting, it's like having a friendly person constantly pairing with you and helping you avoid lots of little mistakes. Let's evaluate this expression to see what it does. Comma E F is going to uh, side eval. This means it's going to evaluate the top level expression. And we can see the type of value that NS Publics is returning. It's a hash map with the key as the short name of the function and the value as the fully qualified name. If we want to keep a record of what the expression evaluates to, we can use the evaluation menu again. But this time, it evaluates the top level expression and return the result as a comment. This is quite useful as you're exploring what your code is actually doing. Let's copy the code uh, and then we can try with a new namespace. Capital D will delete the end of the line and leaves the closing parens in place. And we can type the symbol name for closure at core, which should have over 500 functions in there with the cursor anywhere in or on the parentheses. Evaluate top level form again, turning the results and it's capping the results to about 100 in the UI and it shows the end of the results in the mini buffer. The results are truncated and it's giving us a suggestion of how we can inspect all the results. So comma D is the debug and inspection menu. And we can go and press V to inspect values and we want to go and have a look at the last result. And it's showing us that the type of this result is all contained within inside a closure line persistent hash map with key value pairs. Now we can use N and P to page through all of the results. Pressing return on either the key or the value will show more of its details. So here we can see this is a symbol as a key with a value of plus, and we can use shift L, go back and do the same thing with the value. Here we can see we've got some metadata when it was added, the namespace it's in, the name and so on. So this might be quite useful for us to investigate for our project. And when we're done, we can just press Q to quit. Let's see if we can just get the function names from the hash map. And do yy to copy the line, p to paste new line in. And we want to pass this expression as an argument to another function. So we can use the lisp state, space k, and use w to wrap the existing expression with an outer expression. Press escape to leave lisp state. As we know that NS Publix is returning a map, we can use the keys function which is gonna return a sequence of the keys. So that gives us all the short form names of the functions. And we can also use vowels to get the values. So this is giving us the fully qualified names of those functions. And that's probably gonna be useful because that's where all the metadata was. As we know the value is going to be large, rather than simply evaluating the expression, we can use the CIDR inspector to evaluate and show the result at the same time. Comma D V shows the slider inspect menu, and we use F to evaluate the top level expression and show the results. So we can see this is a sequence and we can scroll through. Uh, we can also dynamically change the page size. And this time it's showing us more information on each page. If we keep the slider inspector open, it will update the values as we evaluate different expressions. Let's just move it to the side using the window menu and capital to move it to the right. And we can resize the 
window that it's using and we can use space z x to also scale up and down the size of the font it's using space one will take us back to our code if we're just using e f to evaluate the top level form then it's going to also update the cider inspector we want to get a random function let's copy that expression p to paste wrap that expression and we want something random so by typing rand it's showing us the different functions that are already part of closure core and if we look at rand nth it's returning a random element of the sequence collection uh, as we have a sequence from vals then that looks like the function that we want you have to evaluate the function rand int has returned a random function called satisfies and in the cider inspect buffer we can see the metadata for that function which we'll use very soon. Our REPL experiments have given us enough insight to start designing our code. Let's create some tests to codify our design. We could use Tremax as a visual browser, space PT, to show us the directory structure, but also switch between the source code branch and the test code branch. Press return, it'll switch us to the test namespace. Pressing space zero jumps us back to Tremax. We can navigate back to the source in that way. Base PT will toggle it off again. I prefer to use the projectile way of switching between the two. So we can do space P for the projectile menu and A to alternate between the source code and test code. The namespace requires the closure test library. I'm going to update by including the specific functions that I'm going to use. And we're including the source code file. I'm going to change this to software under test as an alias using the as key. This is a common naming convention used and it helps us identify specifically the functions we're actually testing. Then you can see CLJ condo is underlined, the practically random function namespace, because we're not actually using this yet. As soon as we start writing expressions that call functions from this namespace, that underscore will go. Let's create our first test by simply just refactoring the test that's already there. So the def test function defines a test and we give a name based on the function that we're actually going to test, which is going to be public functions. And then we add the dash test to the end of the name. Testing gives us some context in which the tests are run, the purpose of those tests. And if we do get failures, then testing helps organize the test results into groups so we can easily find them in the original test code. The is expression is the assertion for the test, and we can have multiple of these if we wish. Is is simply comparing whether something is true or false. If it is true, then a test passes. If it's false, then a test fails. Let's change this assertion. And we should be getting back a sequence when we call public functions with a given namespace. Let's save the file. We can use the test menu, comma t, and a to run all the tests. Oh. We've got an error and we've got a message saying there were no tests. Let's try and fix these. So in the error buffer, it's saying it's got an error compiling random function test. And the description is saying no such var public functions. And that's because we haven't created it yet. So we need to go into the random function source code and create a public functions function. Space PA to switch back. And let's write the shell of a function. Type in defin, choose the snippet, which adds a defin expression that we can fill in. And we can press tab to jump between the different sections. And we'll leave the function body empty for now, as this is enough to make the test compile. Save the buffer and evaluate the function definition. So that function is now in the REPL and side of tests should be able to find it. Run all the tests again. So we don't get an error, but it is saying that we can't find the tests did I forget to use is in my tests? Well, no, I didn't because is is right there. So what, what is going on? Okay, let's see if we can diagnose why we're getting this error. To help us understand whether this is a CIDR error or a error with our code, we can run an external test runner. Space quote will open up our eShell again, and it's done so in our current location. Let's just CD up to the root of the project using the closure command and the test coucher alias from the practically closure depths Eden project. We can run the coucher test runner on our project. Let's just make that window large so we can see the results. And we see it's actually running. Okay, it's actually running the test. We are getting a fail because we've got an empty body in our test. So we can actually see that it's returning nil rather than a sequence, but it is actually running our test. So there is a difference between external test runners like Coucher. They will run the files from the file space, but the Cider. test runner needs everything inside the REPL. If we switch to the 
project configuration file, we can see that we've got the source and resources directories in the path, but the test directory is only included when we use a particular alias. So we need to tell CIDR how to add the test directory when running the REPL. Let's use the REPL manager to quit the REPL. We can use the universal argument, space U, to edit the command when we run sesman start and select CIDR jackin. Now we can use the arrow keys to go in and edit this command before it runs to include the test directory using the test alias that's defined in the project configuration and press enter and we can see that it's included that in the actual startup command. We switch back to the tests using projectile, evaluate the test buffer, load everything in and then run all the tests. Test summary which shows that we're actually running the test and we get our failure as to be expected because again we're not returning any value, we're just returning nil. So now we have a failing test, we can go and fix it and create a passing test. Now we have a failing test, let's go make the test pass. We switch back to the source code. Now we can take one of our REPL experiments and copy that, paste it in, and just change the hard-coded namespace to the argument that we're passing to the function. Evaluate the function so it's in memory, and we can also run the tests from the source code directory as well. And we see down the bottom, we've got green, we've got a green bar. We've run one assertion in one test and we don't have any failures or errors. Success. To avoid editing the command line each time the REPL is started, we can create an Emacs project configuration. So space P E will create a projectile at DIR locals. And if we know the names, we can type in the variables that we want to set. Use the global options to add an alias into the command line. And we specify the alias as a string. That's the only variable we want, so we can just do Control-G, and it writes our configuration for us. It's recommended to specify the particular mode that we want to apply this variable in, just to make clear where it's supposed to be used. We don't need this again, so we can close that buffer. We do need Emacs to read that file, and the most effective way of doing that is reverting a buffer from the current project. So we do space space revert buffer and say yes to confirm. Now if we quit the REPL and start it again, now we can see it's using the M test in there by default and everything is good. So it's very useful to add a DIR locals file before you get started with any project. If you want to check the command that's used to start the REPL, switch to the message buffer and you can see that there is a starting CIDR session entry followed by the actual command that's used to run the REPL. And we can see our alias is included in there. Let's continue developing the project by writing some more tests, creating functions, and maybe also a little bit more experimenting in the REPL. Okay, we've seen that when we were using the CIDR inspector, there's some more information we can get from each function. So let's jump down to the rich comment block and experiment. Using the relative numbers down the side, we can see that we want to jump to a line that's 20 lines away. So we can type in 20 followed by J, and it'll jump us to that line and press O and start a new line. It's a very effective way of moving around using evil and the relative line numbers. Let's take uh, one of our existing functions and we want to be able to wrap it. So we can add another function to that. And we want to use some function that will give us the metadata. If we're not sure what that function is called, we can use the help menu and use CIDR apropos to go and search all the functions based on a pattern. When we start typing meta, we can see there is actually a meta function there and there's quite a few alternatives. We press tab, then we also get the documentation for that function. And we can see this returns the metadata of a particular object. So that looks promising. We can also go and have a look at some of the other functions and press tab and see their documentation as well. So we'll use meta as our function. Now let's evaluate this again, this time using the CIDR inspector. So this is giving us a persistent hash map with keys that will help us retrieve the particular pieces of information that we actually want to use. Is there anything else we can do that's interesting with namespaces? Let's use the help apropos, start typing namespace. We can see there's quite a few functions there. We're already using publics. What if we want to have all of the current namespaces? Let's see if there's something in the closure core that will help us. Let's use the help apropos, and we want something like all ns. Oh, excellent. There it is an all ns function. Pressing tab, and this is going to return a sequence of all namespaces. Perfect. 
We don't get error from our linter, so it looks like we can actually use this without any arguments. We can always go back and check if we can't remember. And actually a quick way of looking is when we do a space after the name, we can see in the mini buffer that it's actually showing us the function signature underneath. And I assume this is going to be a fairly large result. So I'm going to use the Cider Inspector menu and see the results. I mean, see that it's actually bringing in all of the middleware that Cider is actually using, uh, as well as the Closure Core, uh, some NREPL, Cider NREPL. So when it says all namespaces, it really does mean all namespaces. And there are quite a lot, 198. If we wrap that with NS Publics, we go to get an error because we're passing in a closure lazy sequence and we're expecting a closure symbol. The error buffer can show an awful lot of error messages, but you can also hide irrelevant pieces of information. Click any of these names and make them underscore. It actually hides their information. So we can just see what the closure is doing, or we can add in particular Java aspects or REPL aspects. And we can also limit it to just using the project, but the description of the error, it's pretty straightforward, so we don't need to worry about that. So if we map NS publics over all NS, it's giving us a lazy sequence, and each one of those are a map of key value pairs. So really we want to map uh, NS publics and then vals. So we can write a little anonymous function in here. Let's wrap NS publics. We'll slurp in the argument. And then we can wrap again and create vowels. And we can just use the syntax shortcut for an anonymous function. So we've got an error, which is not quite right. We're actually included. And this public needs to call each of the namespaces in turn. So we need to buff that out. So we use the structural editing lisp state. And we can just move that out twice so that we're mapping the whole vowels expression over each of the namespaces and then go in and add the anonymous function placeholder. And this will be quite large, so let's use the CIDR inspector. And we get a lazy sequence of the fully qualified function names for each of the namespaces. However, it is still a sequence of sequences. Each value in the sequence is another sequence itself. So we want to be able to concatenate those together. Let's switch back to the code, and we can just use map cat instead of map. Evaluate, and that will update the CIDR inspector. And now we can see we have a flat sequence of all of the namespaces. Now we want to get a random function and then get the details of that function so we can have the doc string and other useful information. We take the previous function and then we can add rand nth to get a random function. And there we see we get an example of a random function pulled from all of the namespaces and then wrap that function and get the metadata. And this returns a nice simple hash map. As it's not too big, we can simply pretty print that. We can do that as a separate buffer or as it's only small, we can evaluate that to a comment. And this gives us some useful documentation we might want to keep in a design journal uh, just to show how certain functions and expressions are supposed to work, which can help an awful lot when you're trying to debug and maintain code. Let's take our experiments and define tests for all our public functions. Switch to the test code and we can create a, another dev test to test the function, public functions, all NS, and then add test to the end. Add a test string and an assertion to check that we get a sequence back from the function that we're testing. We can add more assertions to the public functions test to cover different namespaces. Let's just copy the is and I use the percent sign to jump to the end of that expression. Press A to append and then we can paste in other assertions and provide specific namespaces. Let's evaluate this uh, public test. If we're not on the test, we can evaluate the previous expression just by doing comma E, and we can evaluate the last S expression. We can do the same thing here. This is not compiling because we haven't actually created the public functions all in S yet. So we need to go and create this. And we can just use a def for this uh, because we're not passing any arguments. If we jump down to our REPL experiments, it is just the results of MapCat. And we want just the values that MapCat create. So we have a sequence of the fully qualified function names from all of the namespaces. Evaluate the def. Let's see if our tests run. They do. We've got three assertions in one test function. Oh, that's only one test function. It's not running our other test function. 
So back to the test. So we either need to run the test from here, which in Spacemax will load in the buffer before it runs the tests, or we can just simply evaluate the test. Start a test run. Now we've got two test functions. We see we've got one assertion error, so it's not quite right. Let's go and refactor our function. Now we can actually simplify this a little bit. So we actually just want to map cat ns publics. So we could just space k raise this up and raise it up again. If you just want to see what that does without running the whole def, we can go just after the closing mapcat expression, comma eval eval last s expression, and that will evaluate just that particular part of the code. Let's wrap this with vals, evaluate just the vals expression. Now we can see we've got the namespaces we want, we've got a nice sequence. Make sure we evaluate the def, switch to the tests. If we evaluate the test, then it clears the results from the previous test run. And now a test run, and the good news is that they're all passing. So now we've got five assertions in two test functions with no errors or failures. So we also want a random function from the sequences of public functions that we've created so far. So let's now create a test for our random function and call it random function details. Test, create a testing context for running all our assertions in. And we're gonna return our function details as a hash map. So we can simply test that that's what we're returning. Uh, and our test is going to call the random function details function. And it's gonna take a sequence of function names as an argument. And we can use the functions we already have to generate that. Let's do space V a few times, and we can select the expression. We copy that, use percent to jump to the end, create a new line, and print out a few more assertions, adding in specific namespaces for each of the assertions. Before we run the test, let's go and create that function. Switch back to the source code. Let's use the snippet, paste in the name. Let's evaluate that. Switch back to the tests namespace. If we run the test from here, it's going to evaluate the new def test. And we see that the three assertions have failed because we haven't actually implemented the function yet. Let's jump to the end of our REPL experiments. And we see this is how we got the metadata. And so we want to take this and create our random function. We want meta, get the details. We want rand nth to get a specific function name. And we've already got the actual sequence, which is in functions. So that should give us the answer. Let's evaluate that function. And now all our tests run. And we've got eight assertions across three test functions, and they're all working. So now we've got our API of our project. We can write a print function to give a nice output for the command line. So we're going to place this function at the top as a help function. We've got a little section divider snippet. And this just helps me separate out logically the different sections of the code. So if this project does grow to be quite large, it becomes very easy to separate these things out into their own namespaces. Let's just add a print print function, which takes in some metadata and print it out by pulling out the particular keys from the metadata and using string to join it up into a nice output. As this is a helper function, I'm not going to write a unit test for this. Let's update the main function to be able to call this code from the command line. So we're going to add a meaningful doc string. When you've got two cases, it's either going to take no arguments or one argument. So let's do the zero argument case and create a, a single argument case. And just to be safe, we'll create a variable argument case as well, but with one fixed argument. So if there's no arguments, then we are going to call pretty print function, which is going to format the random function details for all the public functions in all the namespaces. The one argument branch is going to be the same as above, except we're going to call public functions with the given namespace name. And if somebody calls this more than one argument, we're just going to call main with the namespace name. And let's be friendly and just print out a little warning message. If we look on line 45, our linter is showing that we've got an unused binding. Replace this with an underscore, which is a common approach to having a name, but you're not interested in the actual value. And you can see the linter error has gone, so it's teaching us idiomatic closure as well. So there we go, a project created by Ripple Driven Development for closure using Spacemax. There are many more features of Spacemax and closure development. However, I think we've covered many of the important ones. Take a look at the Practically Spacemax book for examples of how to use Spacemax, not just for closure development, but also general usage of using this amazingly powerful editor. 
and also being able to understand how to make the most out of Vim and Evil Mode, and visit the Practically website to see all the latest live broadcasts and recorded videos, and subscribe to the Practically YouTube channel to be notified when a new video is released. Thank you for watching and good luck with your own development projects.